and I swapped this drive and determination and ambition for success for a big bag of money. And I've often wondered if that swap was as equitable as I might have thought it was at the time. Terry Hall from The Specials was my hero. Is it true that you gave The Specials £1 million to reform? This is what I heard. Virgin Radio 80s Plus. Simon Jordan, welcome to Virgin Radio and Virgin Radio 80s Plus. I'm very, very excited to be sat on a table opposite you. Hello. Me too, mate. I'm listening. I beg, pl- borrowed, pleaded to come on your show. You did. So I'm delighted to be here. I saw you had Jim White the other day. I was most upset with that. I'm because... sorry about that. I wanted to do you both independently Fantastic. because I well, know you. I've got a thousand questions yeah, I need love, to ask you. I love you. music. I think music is so instrument, instrumental in so many people's lives and provides such inspiration and, and elevation. So, you know, whether it's listening to The Doors or whether it's listening to current music, I think there's such a wide range of music to listen to and I love most of it. Now, people who come on to do this, my 80s playlist on Virgin Radio 80s Plus, have said that it's quite a tough task Mm. to whittle down, you know, just ten tracks. It was such a unique era, wasn't it? Yeah. There's so many different phases and so many different changes from the way the 70s finished and the 80s started to the way it then geared up from going from new romantic music, from the early last vestiges of punk through to the ska invasion that was finishing at the 70s and starting in the 80s. Then you've got new romantic and then you've got some you know, different uh, phases of technological music where you've got bands that are starting to use technology and sampling coming into it. So you've got this explosion in the 80s and people ridicule the 80s at times. But I think some of the greatest music that we've heard and seen has come out of the 80s. And so much of it has stood the test of time. And now we realise that, don't we? Joe Jackson stepping out. I mean, what a first try. This is, for me, New York. This is New York City. Absolutely. I mean, Joe Jackson is someone I know personally. My hairdresser, who I've known all my life, cuts his hair. Not so much these days, because Joe hasn't got so much hair. Yeah. But it was just a song that I loved so much because I lived in New York. Um, I was in New York for two years. It was a difficult city, but the whole feel of that song embodied a certain stage of my life. I was trying to be successful. I was trying to be energetic and ambitious, but I was also wanting to be full, sort of full of excitement towards life. And that song really gave it to me and it was on an album you know that there were a lot of good songs on you know whether there's the song cancer on the album or it's different for girls or yeah. kind of clue and uh, they're all songs, good aren't great they great songs and joe jackson was a brilliant brilliant is a brilliant brilliant musician but it was also because when i was in new york at that time he was in a bar and I was sitting at a bar eating chicken wings and playing one of those basketball games. Yeah. And all of a sudden I heard, dun, 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 and it was Joe Jackson playing a piano, trialing the Down to London album. Wow. And so it, it just took me back to that song and all the body of work that he'd had from, yeah. you, know, you know, is she really going out with him? But just that song is just a brilliant, it's one of those songs that you put a roof down in the car and you drive yeah. and you just listen to, and his voice is fantastic. The melodies are fantastic. The words are fantastic. It's just a brilliant, uplifting song. Simon Jordan's picking the, the tracks this week on my 80s playlist. Um, oh, so many memories of this next song. Do you want to introduce this next one? Dex's Midnight Runners. That, my fascination with Dex's Midnight Runners from the name itself, you know, from the idea that that was derived from some form of um, substance that people <laughs> wanted to use in the 80s through to Kevin Rowland, through to that particular look and feel through to the saxophone that they played, the, the marching feet on top of the pops and the pop band, and so the pop videos that they did. It was, to me, I was 12, 13. It was a turning of the 70s into the 80s, and this was some song, and this song stands the test of time. When you, this was released, if yep. I've done my research right, you were, back then, an aspiring footballer. Correct. That, so yep. back then, were you thinking, this is what I want? I want to be a professional footballer? Yeah, very much so. You know, I was, I was, at, I was at Chelsea, as a football club, but I was my father had been a professional footballer, so my background was sports. My mother had worked as a beautician uh, and working within the realms and a hairdresser at Vidal Sassoon's, and so I got the arts and the creative side alongside the football and also the academic side that my parents wanted me to have. So I spent a lot of time playing sport, but I also spent a lot of time with my mother listening to wonderful music, whether that be the funk of the 70s with Chic. Uh, and Roy Ayers and people of that yeah. nature or, or Bob James and Earl Clue or whether it be my particular penchant at the time which was the specials and Scar yes. and that sort of generation which features in my life and in my story later on in one of my song choices but just this song you know I, I loved Turay and what they became but Gino searching for the Soul Brothers 
was from that album I think it was called and just Gino just the beat and the feeling of this rebellious youth and Kevin Rowland at the front of it and the energy when they came out with those saxophones was just I play it pretty much every day I train in the gym every day and I play Gino every single day I love Kevin Rowland I think he's I, I, I think he's a musical genius very quirky yeah I think he's a Wolverhampton Wanderers fan and I t- won't hold that against him but I just think this song is such a song you know there was another song out at the time you know that pig bag um, um, that Papa's got a brand new pig bag yeah, that pig yeah. bag made and it had that same sort of feel but this is the one the Gino by Dex's Midnight Runners forget about it this is the one brilliant 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 Simon I must ask you about you're at Talk Sport now yeah. we discussed a moment ago yeah. your partner Jim White was yeah. on a couple of weeks ago yeah. I, um, I've i done a, a few bits in some of your studios and yeah. I see the amount of texts that come in yeah. I've never worked at a radio station and seen so much interaction you guys yeah. are on fire the audience absolutely love you whether they agree with you or they don't yeah. they're with you aren't they well it's a it's a, it's a great platform Platform. You know, I when I was a football club owner, I'm in the media because I enjoy it, not because I have to, and not because it's an economic determinant for me, but it's because I clearly loved a f- sport. That's why I spent £50 million on a football club. I come from a background of sport, and then going into the media, I had reservations about it because I had a wariness about the media having been on the other side of the argument yes. as a football club owner. But when you're in a position, for me, I'm in a unique space. There aren't many former Premier League football club owners that speak in the media, and certainly aren't ones that are doing media shows. So I get to operate in a slight vacuum, an interesting vacuum where I can have strong opinions and 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 have an engagement with the audience. And when you've got a listening base of 1.1 million people and you've got a show that's got a presenter like Jim White that drive people get the wrong end of the stick with Jim. They don't understand what it takes to drive a show. I got the easy part. I'm first responder. Yeah. I get to respond to the questions and, and and come out with my highfalutin opinions. Jim has to schedule and structure the show and make sure that it's a debate rather than a monologue or a set of people agreeing with one another. So it's a fascinating scenario. It's also a privilege because when you see and you go out and about and you see how influential, this is what I've learned about the media more so than I ever knew before, is how influential the media can be and it's also a great responsibility you have to use that influence properly Mm -hmm. so I try to steer down the path of being equitable and fair and having common sense centred in my observations and sometimes I can disappear into the hyperbole but we (laughs) we, we are all guilty of that because we're in the business of entertaining at the same time as informing so I, I think it's great I think it's fantastic you know how long I'll do it I don't know but whilst I am doing it I enjoy it and I think working for talk sport, for me, when I look across at the other platforms, some of the subject matter that myself and Jim take on, some of the debates that we have, whether it's racism in football or it's a whole raft of sort of sort of slightly difficult subjects to touch. And sometimes I walk a tightrope that I'm very conscious that I'll fall off and maybe strangle myself with. Mm. But I think people appreciate authenticity. I think they appreciate honesty. They may not always agree with your opinions, and that's fine. Because, you know, I'm not, this isn't the world according to Garp or Jordan in this instance. It's an opinion that I can often stand up, but I'm more than happy for people to engage with it and challenge it. In fact, I want that sort of challenge because football fans and the listeners of broadcasters like yours and our show are the lifeblood of it, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. And what a building we work in. Absolutely. I mean, here in the news building, you can, it's not unusual to see, you know, an England manager at one side of the corridor and someone like Kevin Costner down the other. Absolutely. I mean, I bumped into Richard uh, Dreyfus years ago, uh, a couple of years ago, sorry, when he was walking down the corridor. And I said, do you know what my favourite film was? And he said, he thought I was going to say Jaws or Close <laughs> Encounters. And I said, The Goodbye Girl. And he was like, you like The Goodbye Girl? It's a brilliant <laughs> film. So, so it's a, you know, and of course, you've seen other people. You know, you've seen some of the great rock stars being in here. Well, I had Noel Gallagher in the other day. Noel and, Noel and I are friends. So you're mates with Noel, yeah, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And Noel came in. And next week, we've got Russell Brand coming in because he's a big football yeah. fan. So football and sport reaches people in some often the same way as music does. Yes. Yeah. And so there's this synergy. Um, you know, and we've had some of the greats in. And, you know, Rod Stewart comes in because he's friends yeah. with Jim. And there's this great crossover because people forget on the whole, musicians come from the same sort of backgrounds as often professional sports people do. Yeah, and I thought it was such a good idea to get some talk sport into Virgin Radio because, yeah. um, you well, know, we're you. all I'm mates and, and it works. And well, I, I had to joined. crowbar my way in here, Steve. Well, no, no, it was crowbar. only a matter of time. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about, and I'm overjoyed that you picked Curiosity Kill yeah. the Cat. Look at my face yeah. here. Yeah. What a band. I always think they kind of filled in the space between Live Aid yeah. and when some of those big dance acts came out in kind of 88. Why, why have you picked them? It just was, I mean, through life you have these sort of light bulb moments with things that you really enjoy. And when I first listened to The Doors Mm. and I listened to Riders on the Storm and things like that, I went, wow, this 
Jim Morrison character is fascinating. And I read Danny Sugarman's book, uh, in Wonderland Avenue, all about the Doors and his management of it. And then I listened to the specials, and that band was so important to me. And then in the mid 80s, I'm going through, I'm 18, 19 years of age, I'm going out to work and begin, beginning to have a view on the world and f- find my place in it and becoming a little bit of a Jack the Lad. And I turned on a Saturday show and I just saw Ben. Uh, Perot on stage dancing yeah. to I think it was originally uh, Misfit. That's right. right? Uh, and then I saw them released Down to Earth and I think um, it was either Misfit or Down to Earth was the last video that Andy Warhol did. And it was just this... The, the, Ben's voice was phenomenal. The music was fantastic. And it just made me feel for once in my life that I wanted to be like someone else. I always wanted to be like me. Right. right? I had this very uh, very over-egged sense of self-worth and when I saw Ben Vialper Perot on stage or singing on this pop video I just thought well I want to be like him wow he's cool he was and, very cool and wasn't I saw he? them on top of the pops and I just remember them singing down to earth and they were having such fun together and there's this moment when I'm watching it when Ben turns I think it was either to Nick Thorpe or one of the other band members and just smiles at them and I thought did they cracked it man yeah they're 20 years of age 21 years 22 years of age and they've cracked it yeah and they're doing what they love they've got fabulous music they're dating beautiful women I think at the time maybe Ben was going out with someone who became a friend of mine years later Mandy Smith um, and I just thought I want to be these fellas and the music and again it's another one of those not because I'm an old person that's stuck in the wood or stuck in the ways because I listen to all kinds of music and I have a view on all of it from whatever generation but I still listen to that now I was fortunate enough to get Ben to play for me at my 40th birthday. Oh, amazing. Um, and so, What's he up to these days? Well, he, you know, he's had some difficult troubles in his life. Yeah. Um, and I, I, ironically, I saw him a few years ago on that celebrity dating show where he went on there and the girl was saying, what was your favourite band? Do you ever see that? No, I didn't. Ben was on there sitting at the bar with his big hat, but a really dickers version of it, the, the, the backward hat that he used to wear. And the girl said, um, you look familiar. I don't, I, you know, I, I'm sure I know you from somewhere. And he, he said, well, yeah, you know, maybe you do, maybe you don't. She said, well, well, what do you do? He said, oh, I used to be a music. She goes, oh, my favourite band from the 80s was Curiosity Kills the Cat. <laughs> and he went, I, I was the lead singer. Oh. <laughs> now, Ben Ben played for me a couple of occasions. He played for me on my 40th birthday, which was a big event with a, a whole raft of people that sang at it. And some of them are on this list. Um, and I also owned a restaurant group in Mayfair. And Ben came and did some open mic nights with us um, and sang the old songs that he had uh, been obviously involved with. I think he's had some troubles in his life and I think he's had some challenges. Um, but he's still around, still doing his Lovely. thing. Great Still to hear. gigging. Um, at a massive row, he and Lee John from Imagination had a massive row at one of my birthday parties <laughs> because they didn't like one another. Called one another consummate unprofessionals. Um, but I loved Curiosity, Killed the Cat. I love that album that they produced in 87, I think it was, which had Misfit, Ordinary mm. Day, um, you know, a whole raft of songs, and of course, Down to Earth. And Down to Earth, to me, I think, is just about what it's like to be 19, 20 years of age and full of fun. Simon, Honey Thief, Hipsway, yeah. I had this on uh, a cassette that I used to listen to on my Sony Walkman, only had a fast forward button. Me too. <laughs> me too. This was, uh, this, what a great 80s. What a well, moment I think here. so. I mean, the, you had this sort of genre of bands that were kicking around at the time, you know, Hipsway. Um, the Blow Monkeys, yeah. Curiosity Killed the Cat, and they were all, and I was also listening to a little bit of Matt Bianco from that, you know, uh, album, um, uh, I forget what it's called now. Uh, that was what I saw Cake in Waterman's earlier works, wasn't was, it? Was, was, that, was Matt Bianco that? Because yeah. I remember Matt, Matt, Mark Riley from Matt Bianco going on one of the, on the Breakfast Time TV shows and someone phoning in saying a very rude word to him, but right. Matt Bianco or a bunch of whatever. But when they did Get Out of Your Lazy Bed and stuff like that, yeah. it was great. So... Hipsway were one of those to me and and for some reason or other I alighted upon them I don't know where I saw them first but they were just this the first song I, he- I heard from them was Ask the Lord and I just thought it was a brilliant song Yeah. so when I bought the album they had other songs on there like Tinder and Long White Car but the Honey Thief song with the brilliant guitar to me just leapt out and there's two versions on the album there's the extended version which has a real mix on the back of it and the original version and it was just this look and feel it was more to do with a sound um of course that sounds you know ridiculous to say because everything's to do with the sound but there was with some of the other music that i liked it was also about the look and the attitude and the yes, feel and the yeah. energy this was about the sound of the guitar and the lead singer's voice and and i know they sound like stating the bleeding obvious but it was just simply that and again it was at a period in my life where i was full of beans i'm full of beans now but full of energy and young dumb and perhaps full of the other thing um, um, and all that goes with that and so it just was 
that it this this song the honey thief just leaps out when you listen to it when that guitar lick goes off and it opens a song with it's just forget about it that's what really attracted me to it amazing i must yeah. ask you there's so much to ask you as far as your career is concerned because it's got so many twists and turns isn't mm, it we've got the downs, mobile yeah. phone yeah we've got the young footballer yeah. the mobile phone the crystal palace yeah. um what leaps out of you if i was to say you know what's your career highlight um i've yet to have it um obviously you know i made the best part of 100 million pounds when i was 30 I mean, that's it. so much money, Sam. Can we just well, pull... You say it like that. Well, you know, that, that, was is... then, that was then, this is now. You know, I was very good at an industry, a very, very exciting, dynamic industry, a very forward-thinking industry with lots of progression in it, which suited my personality because I was an ambitious, quick-thinking, dynamic-driven person. Yeah. And the mobile telephony industry lent itself to that. You know, I, I bought a football club because I felt that the industry itself would be something I would uh, enjoy. It, it kind of wasn't because football can be an unrewarding business and it's a thankless task. And it seems really brutal. Oh, Did you enjoy it? No, not really. I mean, the moments of enjoyment. I look back, not like sort of the character out of Shawshank Redemption where I wish I could counsel myself for doing, th- not counsel, <laughs> counsel it, but counsel myself. Yeah. In terms of enjoy the moments because they're few and far between. We got promoted to the Premier League and all that went with that. And I was a very slightly... Not very, but I was a controversial character because I was the first breed of football club owners that became very visible. Um, and previously, it had been one of the best kind of football club owners, the ones you never hear from. Yeah. And in you this were sense, all over it, weren't you? People I knew was. who you were, they knew what you yeah, wanted. But it wasn't because I'd wanted it to be that way. It wasn't because I was trying to live vicariously through my football club. It's because I wasn't prepared to tolerate some of the crap that I saw in football. And I sat there thinking, why am I writing checks out for other people to take the mickey out of me? Why should I hold myself? to a set of standards that no one else holds themselves to. Yeah. Why should I allow people to get away with not doing what they should be doing? And, of course, that put me on a collision course with the media and, on, and of course, with the football authorities. So 10 years of a football club um, hurt me economically and a little bit psychologically because I didn't win in the end. But it also took me on over after other journeys because I got into uh, films um, and theatre and, um, and music and... Um, with one of my great loves, a band that we'll talk about later in my song list. Yes. Um, in being very heavily involved in their reformation. Yeah. Um, because I could and I would and I was determined to achieve it and we'll talk about that I'm sure later yeah. on. And then making films like Telstar, the story of Joe Meek. Yeah. Who was a, a, an absolute revolution of a music producer that people like Phil Spector and George Martin listened to and learned from. He was the master of refurb in the 60s. Mm. He turned down the Rolling Stones. He turned down Rod Stewart and a variety of other bands. Um, but he produced some of the best songs in the 60s from a bed set above a handbag shop on the it's Holloway Road. And, story, my, and my friend, Nick Moran, who was the lead actor in Lockstock and Two Smoking Barrels, had written this, this screenplay and this stage play. And so I decided to get involved and fund it for the tour and also for the stage play in London. Mm-hmm. And then I decided to make a film of it and we cast some fascinating people. I know this is a little bit taboo at this moment in time, but he was on his game at that time for a variety of reasons. Kevin Spacey was cast because of Nick's friendship with him and I knew Kevin. Yeah. James Corden was cast in his first major role. J.J. Feld was cast as Heinz Burt, who was one of the leading singers in Joe Meek's stable. Con O'Neill, who's a brilliant actor, who was a lead actor in the stage play, was also in Blood Brothers, which is a Bill Kenwright yeah, production, course. and Bill was my friend. Right. And so you had this wonderful cast. You also had you know people from the 60s, Mike Berry from the Hollies and all people of that nature featuring it. Rita Tushingham was in it. She was a famous actor from the 60s. And we produced this brilliant, brilliant, brilliant sh- film, a bit like Quadrophenia or Widnell and I mm-hmm. in terms of its sort of niche appeal. Went into 50 cinemas. And it was just a labour of love for me because I love. Can the... you see it now, by the way? Well, you can see it. You can you can you can watch it on uh, Amazon. You can watch it on various television stations because I've sold it to the BBC and I've sold it to uh, broadcasters around the world. Mm. If you Google, Google Toast Telstar, the Joe Meek story, you'll find it. Lovely. It is beautifully directed, brilliantly acted, wonderfully produced, um, and a fascinating story of adversity. Tragic in its ending because it's a quite a, a, a you know a difficult ending. It's about a you know a tone deaf gay man that in a time when it was illegal to be gay in this country yep. the one in Ivan Novello mm-hmm. that was uh, arrested for importuning in a public toilet and ended up killing himself and his landlady really sad altercations with the craze and all kinds of things but my word genius at work brilliant, brilliant. and a fascinating film and a beautiful project to be involved in 
I knew we'd do this. I've gone off the music. I've, mm-hmm. I've, we, we should do, be here for another three hours. Uh, let's talk about Sergeant Rock. Yeah. XTC, next track on your list. Just tell me briefly, you introduced this. Well, it's just a brilliant piece of music. I mean, XT, XTC are a fascinating band, you know, uh, where, you know, from the Nigel song through to Sergeant. Sergeant Rock was a song that I remember, for me, going away skiing uh, when I was at school, I went to a, a, a comprehensive school over in Old Causton, and I was fortunate enough my parents would send me away a to a skiing trip to Verona, and there were two songs that were played on the jukebox repeatedly and endlessly on that trip. It was Hotter Than July by Stevie Wonder, yeah, and it was Sergeant Rock by XTC, and it's just stayed with me, yeah. and it just catapults me back every time I listen to it to being 12 or 13 years of age, falling backside over boob, down down uh, blue run ski slopes um, and it just again takes me back to a space and the music itself and the tone of the singer just was for me an intriguing song I'm so glad Simon hopefully you're enjoying this this week hearing these songs I'm Love so it. glad you put Tears Love. for Fears in because yeah. for me they're not only one of my favourite 80s yeah. bands but one of my favourite bands yeah. of all time and they've done so much and this is um, I think within the first five seconds of this song it takes you back to of course it does the 80s of course in the does. very best way doesn't it I mean a lot of people get confused with where, where it started and where Bob Geldof's adaptation of it became more prevalent. Yeah. But this was the song. The video was brilliant. I mean, one of the things that drove me to the video, in, in terms of not just the music, was the Austin Healey 3000 that I wanted to buy, which is the car <laughs> yeah. that Kurt drives in the video. And just the song, it's just a, you know, it makes you feel energised. It makes you feel enthused. It makes you feel that you want to go out and do things. And that's why it was utilised in other ways. Yes. And it's so... They used it with, there was Everybody Wants to Run the World, correct. wasn't there? So they re, yes, remodelled the re-engineered song. it, which yeah. was the Bob, Bob Geldof connection, yes. wasn't it? yeah. And so they used it as a charitable side of things. But the song itself, you know, I always remember it because the Austin Healey 3000, because I wanted to buy one, couldn't afford one, ended up with a Triumph Spitfire, which I showed to my father, and the window fell out in his hand as he was opening the door. Whoops. So he laughed me away from the curb. <laughs> but just that song, I think... I was 16 years of age, um, coming out, or actually being thrown out. I say coming out of school, but I was thrown out of school um, and going to college. Hmm? Can I ask why? Why? Um, Because I was a difficult student and I had a smart outlook and didn't really respond very well to authority. (laughs) Shall we leave it at that? I'm not surprised. (laughs) Shall we leave it at that? Um, I'll be disappointed if there was another answer. But this song for me in in the mid-80s, when you're moving away and you've got bands like Wham that are dominating the charts and you know and Culture Club and and Duran Duran are revving their engines up, this was another song that really resonated with me and really made me feel a young man alive. Simon, I'm really interested about this Roachford song that yeah. you've picked. Um, Andrew Roachford, what an amazing yeah, yeah, singer. Yeah. Also, recently, I was overjoyed to hear the news that he's now the lead singer of Mike and the Mechanics. Is so he? They, they're using him oh, on fantastic. their current tour, and I can totally hear that, but yeah. you could have picked, like, Family Man I could or have picked Cuddly, Cuddly Toy. toy. Yeah, yeah, uh, why this yeah. one? This is beautiful. Or My Generation. Yeah, of yeah. course. But because it's such a beautiful song, yeah. the words are great, the rhythm is great, it's the first track on the side, on the second, on, on side two, and it's just a song about someone being in a relationship that whose parents don't approve of it, of that particular relationship, and Roachwood's voice just resonates. Cuddly Toy was a fanat- for no, again with a great guitar lick, and I used to, you know, I had a Lotus Esprit when I was 22 years of age, thought I'd arrived, and I used to, ra- you know, roar around listening to Cuddly Toy, but there was something very melodic and engaging and I think the composition of Kathleen as a song was more structured yeah. and, and showed greater sides of Andy Rocher's talent totally than this, is the, this is his demo really yeah. isn't it yeah. this is him saying to the world look you know look at this voice yeah it's his calling card brilliant yeah. isn't it and a much a much much underrated songwriter and artist I'm going to chuck a question at you. You just mentioned about the Lotus and stuff. Do you ever kind of look back and pinch yourself and go, I've done all of this. I've earned all of this money. I've got all of these great stories. I know all of this, these famous people. No. Or do you, how do you take all the success and all the stories? Well, I think, first of all, they're my stories. So they're my experiences. So they're relatable to me and they're not something I looked at. The only time I've ever been impressed and in awe with someone... Um, in person, well, there's two times. Most recently, Carl Froch, the boxer, who I really like, and I did a, a show and a, a podcast with him. 
But Terry Hall from the specials was my hero, and we'll cover that shortly, I'm yes. sure. Yeah. And just when Terry came to set, it was like all my bedrooms, all my sitting in my bedroom with my mum going, turn that bloody music down, <laughs> came flowing through my mind and wishing that I'd been old enough to go to see the specials in concert wishing that i could have been there when they were when the album when the, when the covers of too much too young were taking pictures of all the kids at the front with you know the specials on the front cover so for me i don't think about the fact i made a lot of money lots of people have made lots of money and i never did anything for money i did things for achievement i wanted to be good i wanted to be better than other people i wanted to excel and I, I, of course the commodity often that proves that you've done that is money, yeah, right? That's yeah. the definer of meritocracy. And then what you do with money is another definer. I never, I found that when I made a lot of money, it took away some of my motivations and took away some of the things that had really driven me to be successful. So I, I, I look at back with that. I, I made a, I made this sort of analogy in, in a, I wrote a best-selling book, all about me, um, <laughs> but my, about my journey in football predominantly. Um, but about this, this equitability of a swap, I swapped a business that I loved, that I, you know, I breathed in every pore of, and, and every part of my character was indexed to getting up in the morning and driving this business to build 250 shops in five years. And I swapped this drive and determination and ambition for success for a big bag of money. And I've often wondered if that swap was as equitable as I might have thought it was at the time. Because you lose something. Some people want to go and make more money. Some people want to become a billionaire. I've yeah. got mates of mine that are billionaires, that are guys that are continuing to want to do it. But that was them, and that wasn't me. I wanted to do things because I wanted to live life through the challenges that were in front of me. So when I look back at the, pe the company that I've kept, the people that I've travelled with, the experiences that I've had, they were just there. Yeah. You know, there's an irony. We have Noel Gallagher the other day and there's a strange little story because Meg Matthews, his wife, was with me. Yes. <laughs> so we're sat there and having a little chat one Is another. Is that awkward? No, no. I mean, I've known Noel and his daughter, his young daughter, or not so young now, and AS for a long time. Um, and, you know, and, and as we get older as well, Steve, you know, you're not the same. I'm not, you know, you look at the world differently. You get wiser and you get more structured in your thinking and you don't, people like me, don't reform I suspect they just run out of a little bit of wind is it true that you gave the specials one million pounds to reform this is what I heard what I did was because I was so determined to reform them and they were beyond reforming right um, I spent time with all of them the late great John Bradbury the late greatest Terry Hall yeah God rest his soul went to his funeral in January this year through to Neville Staple to Linville Golding to Jerry Damas the architect of two-tone mm -hmm. in this country. Amazing. And there was such difficulty. And, of course, there were Roddy Byers and Horace Panter in the band as well. And I, did, I was determined this band will reform. <laughs> and, and I was in that frame of mind where I had the influence and the ability and the money to make decisions. And so as part of my decision-making process, I decided to offer them Simon Moran, who owns SJM yeah. Productions, is a friend of mine. The guys that own Metropolis, which was a big um, uh, um, uh, company that put up the rigs uh, and all the uh, the touring equipment for events, were also in my orbit. And so I said to this boys, if need be, I said to Jerry Dammers, actually, who was a strange little character, looked like a refugee from Middle Earth. Um, <laughs> and uh, listen, if it need be, I'll give you guys a million quid. He said, I haven't told the rest of the band, have you? <laughs> so I said, well, and he said, we're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. Did you see... Did you see what happened last time I put my head above the parapet when I did Rock Against Racism with Nelson Mandela and the Nelson Mandela song? They cut all my phones off. So what's the conspiracy theory you're referring to, Jerry? Maybe you just didn't pay the bill. But what I said was, if you don't reform, Jerry, I'm going to buy the back, pack, back catalogue from EMI. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> you were determined, weren't determined. you? So I got, them back to, I got them to reform. Did it cost you a million? No, it didn't. Because there was not a necessity for it to be that way. I would have paid it because that bond would have gone towards making sure that the tour that they would have gone on would have been underwritten. But they did seven world tours after that. <laughs> they produced a number one best-selling album in yes. 2019. Um, and their music, and I used to go around all the football stadiums when people were reading about it because they had this natural strap line in the newspapers. Because I was so young as a football club owner, they used the song that the specials did called Too Much Too Young and they, they, they attached it to me. Too much too young for this, too much too young for yeah. that. 
And so when I was going around all the football stadiums, I was going up to the, when we played Liverpool, Everton. Hey, Jordan, lad, are you going to get those specials back together? And I was telling the boys when I met them, you've got no clue of how you're going to be received. You think your things are the past. Your things are the present. Yeah. And so that proved to be when they were out and they'd sold out everything. They didn't want to do big stadiums. They wanted to do the same sort of event news that they did when they were yeah. a band in the late 70s, early 80s. So it was this whole new lease of life for them, wasn't totally. it? Totally. Yeah. And Linville came back from America and the boys got back together. Jerry never came back, which is his loss. But they went and did... They, the first gig they ever did was my 40th birthday. Wow. I got to introduce the specials. Um, I made a Horlicks of it because they were supposed to be playing and they're supposed to be sitting at the drum kit and I was standing on the stage half cut saying I've been waiting to say this since I was 13 too much too young and then of course there's a drum sound but they weren't sitting at the drum kit but Terry Hall came on the stage and said could you do this properly (laughs) 